Hello and welcome to our webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on federal, state, and local budgets. This is the sixth in a series of webinars aimed at cities and regions in the post-coronavirus era, initiating community conversations on what lessons we can learn from this crisis to make a more sustainable and resilient world. My name is Katie Phillips and I am the Outreach Coordinator at the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis, otherwise known as CURA. I will be your host for this event. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar in the Q&A box. We will ask as many of your questions as we can in the last portion of the panel discussion. And if we do not get to your question, we do apologize. If you have any additional questions following this event, please feel free to email me at phillips.1870 at osu.edu. There will also be a short survey at the end of the webinar. If you have time, please provide your feedback. I am now going to kick it over to our moderator for this event, Curious Director Harvey Miller. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the latest webinar in our series on uh, cities and regions in the post-coronavirus era. Again, I'm Harvey Miller, Director of CURA and Professor of Geography at The Ohio State University. And I'd like to just mention a few other events we have coming up soon. Um, we're continuing our webinar series on, on COVID impacts through this semester. So on um, November 6th, Thursday, we'll have another event in the series, the impact of COVID-19 on K through 12 education and childcare. And our panelists then will be Dr. Talissa Dixon, the superintendent of Columbus City Schools, James Davies O'Leary, or Jamie Davies O'Leary, associate director of, of the excuse me, <laughs> Associate Director of the um, Crane Center and Schaumbrunn Family Center at OSU, excuse me, uh, and Dr. Er Eric Karolak, who's a chief, chief Executive Officer of Action for Children. So that should be a really good panel. That's November 6th. And we're having one last panel in this series on November 30th, which will be a, a, revi a revi revision of our economic impacts panel we had back in the spring where are we now uh, nine months later? And that will be Bill Lafayette, uh, Jennifer Clark from the Knowlton School and Eddie Pauline from the, the Glenn College. And that was a really good panel the first time around. And uh, we're gonna revisit the question, what are the economic impacts that we're seeing from COVID-19? I also wanna mention that in spring 2021, we'll be going back to our regular themed uh, events in Cura and our event theme this spring will be uh, strengthening our legacy cities. I don't wanna announce any of the speakers or events right now because they're not official, but I will say that we're working on a really all-star lineup of prominent thought leaders, both in Ohio and at the national scale, all addressing this topic of how do we strengthen the legacy cities of Ohio and other places um, in this part of the country. So I encourage you to uh, visit our website and sign up for our newsletter, cura.osu.edu. Uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You'll never miss any of these events or activities that are happening here at the Center for Urban Regional Analysis at The Ohio State University. Okay, great. So now we'll jump into today's panel. Today's panel is on budget impacts at the state and local level of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm gonna introduce our uh, speakers. Uh, first, Megan Kilgore. Megan Kilgore was elected city auditor of Columbus, Ohio on November 17, 2017 and took the office on January 1st, 2018. The city auditor includes the offices of income tax, financial reporting, debt management, accounting and operations, payroll services and financial systems for the city of Columbus. So she knows where all the money is in the, in the city. Uh, Kilgore earned a bachelor's degree from The Ohio State University and a master's degree in public administration from Northwestern University. Thanks for joining us today, Megan. Jim Landers has also joined us. He teaches public budgeting and finance and has research interests in state and local taxation and state and local economic development programs and policy. And he uh, is a faculty in the Glenn College at Ohio State University. He received his PhD from Ohio State University and an MPA from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock and a BA from the University of Kentucky. Jim, thanks for joining us today. And finally, Kimberly Mernix. She was appointed Director of the Office of Budget and Management by Governor Mike DeWine on January 14, 2019. She serves as Chief Financial Officer under the leadership of Governor DeWine, and she oversees an office that develops, coordinates, and monitors individual budgets of state agencies, provides the governor and administration with 
policy analysis and reviews all financial transactions made with public funds for the state of Ohio. That's a, that's a big job, Megan, or uh, Kimberly, sorry. Uh, Director Murnix is a summa cum laude graduate of Marietta, Marietta College with a bachelor's in political science and is a graduate of The Ohio State University's Glenn College of Public Affairs with a master of public administration specializing in public finance. Thanks for joining us today. Kimberly, and now we'll start off with opening session, opening comments from each of our panelists. And we'll, go, we'll start with the big picture um, overview from uh, Jim. Jim, please. All right, thanks, Harvey. Um, I guess, you know, my analysis is always gonna start with the, uh, of the budget impacts of a recession is primarily gonna start on the revenue side. Um, the, the one thing I'll say about the recession, I think recessions are all different in the way that they start and how long they last and how they play out. But this one is really unique compared to recent recessions uh, in terms of cause, in terms of how quickly it happened, the severity of it, and how quickly the economy has started to recover, um, you know, once business is reopened. I'm not saying it's totally recovered, but the, there has been a fairly quick bounce back to some extent. Um, in terms of budgetary impacts, I would say that, that some of them have been, um, you know, typical of other recessionary periods, but some of the impacts have been unique. Um, I think, you know, one of the typical things that happens is that state and local governments, they are experiencing, you know, what I would call significant, or they have experienced significant revenue volatility that usually follows sharp declines in, in the economy like GDP uh, personal income, and then spikes in unemployment as well, uh, like what happened in the first and second quarters of the year. And, uh, you know, as a result, major general fund revenue sources for state and local governments like sales tax, personal income tax, and, and corporate taxes, and even some of the, the lesser ones like uh, gaming taxes, have experienced significant volatility and significant declines over the last four or five months. Um, just to sort of give you an example to kind of frame this, I, I saw a survey from, it was a National Association of State Budget Officers. They did a survey of states that closed their budgets on June 30th, their fiscal 2020 budgets on, on June 30th. And that's 45 states that, that have a July 1 to June 30th fiscal year. And the states on average experienced a 3% decline in general fund revenue year over year in fiscal year 2020. And they had budgets that they probably enacted probably back in the spring of 2019 that were predicated on a 3% increase in revenue. So they were dealing with like, like a six, on average, a 6% swing in resources. Um, and, and even part of that swing was due to the change in the filing date for personal for income taxes. Even after they adjusted for that, NASBO found an average revenue decline of 1.6%. So there was still a, a sizable swing in resources for the fiscal 2020 budget. And what made it even more challenging, I'm sure, is that it happened right at the end of the fiscal year. So states and local governments that have a July 1, June 30th fiscal year had to make some pretty quick adjustments to balance their budgets at year end. Um, I, I think on the spending side, the, the two sort of counter cyclical programs I think of at, at the state and local level are Medicaid which is a general fund uh, uh, program, and then unemployment, which is a special revenue source. Nevertheless, those things have spiked in terms of cost and spending uh, at this point, as would be typical in any recession. Um, typical for other recessions, state and local governments are responding to the revenue shortfalls um, by you know, spending cuts uh, using reserve, the re budgetary reserves that they've saved, and doing fund transfers. Um, they're, you know, transferring funds from lower priority programs to high priority programs like Medicaid or even like K through 12 uh, funding. Um, so I think that's sort of typical. I think one of the things that's varied over recessions, and, I, and I'll quickly sort of close here, is that um, federal government has not always provided sort of general, significant general aid for states and local governments to shore up their budgets. They didn't do that in 2001 during that recession. 
they did under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act during the Great Recession. There was significant dollars sent, sent to states and local governments to shore up budgets. This time around, that really hasn't happened. CARES Act money is pretty limited. It's targeted to certain uh, programs or certain purposes. However, the difference here is that there was so all the stimulus that was directed towards households and businesses, you know, whether it was the direct subsidies under the CARES Act, whether it was the enhanced unemployment benefits, or whether it was uh, ongoing wage payments from businesses that took PPP loans, that I think had an impact. It helped prop up state and local sales taxes and personal income taxes during the summer. So even though there's not been direct aid there in indirect way, there was federal aid that I think probably helped out budgets during the summer. Um, the other thing that I think we've yet to see is how long will the recession last, but how long will revenues lag the economy? Typically revenues at state and local level lag the economic recovery uh, to some extent, six months to a year, maybe even more. And so we've yet to see how long it's gonna take for revenues to recover. And if it's a typical recession, they're gonna lag the recovery uh, and it'll be you know, maybe a year after or so before revenues sort of hit uh, the high point before the pandemic. Uh, so long story short, there's sort of budget impacts that are typical and there's some that are a little different this time around. Okay, thank you, Jim. And now we'll um, zoom down to the state of Ohio. Kimberly will give us some comments. Sure, thanks, Harvey. Um, I think the initial um, need to gather data, to understand data, and constantly update that data has been key for Ohio. In Ohio, we began our planning for how to address the budgetary um, impacts of coronavirus as soon as we heard about the virus in Asia. I will say that at that point in time, our initial concerns really centered around the potential revenue impacts of disrupted supply chains that um, quickly pivoted to more um, a higher magnitude of budgetary action, actions once the it became clear that um, the virus was going to um, impact our, our national perspective and our state directly. So we went from in February taking some very early behind the scenes actions, slowing hiring, containing some state agency expenses, slowing um, some of our contractual decision making to really taking um, larger actions around the state budget in um, April and May Jim mentioned the movement of the income tax deadline filing de from April until July. That had a huge impact on the state of Ohio's budget and moved hundreds of millions of dollars out of fiscal year 20 and into fiscal year 21. What we found is that throughout this time, throughout this crisis, communication has really been key. Talking daily with local government partners, with um, doctors with experts from around the state and around the country that has helped us make quick decisions. It has helped us address the pandemic um, from a health perspective, but also from a budgetary perspective. It's helped us plan our budget decision makings so that we could plan for those expected revenue declines. Um, it has, it's been a challenge, but Ohio has been resilient and as we continue to look ahead to what the additional impacts on our economic situation will be and how that will affect the state budget, both this fiscal year and in the upcoming biennium, you know, it, again, just having that continuous updated data, those constant conversations has really been just so important. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. And what about you, Megan? What's happening in Columbus? What did your What are your data models telling you about what you see going forward in terms of budget? So I think it's important to uh, first of all, it's nice to be here, and I have a deep amount of respect for uh, OSU being a thought leader in this conversation, as well as the OBM director, because this is about information sharing. We are stronger together, 
And um, I will tell you, though, um, Mr. Landers, Professor Landers, I was a student of his at Northwestern. And as I mentioned to you all before, and all of that uh, great curriculum uh, that I received, nowhere did he say as auditor, if you ever run for an office, you got to prepare yourself for a health pandemic. So um, I'm not going to fault him too hard because, frankly, never, uh, I don't think any class did this ever come up in. Um, what, you know, what Kim and I have to always think about in our respective roles is preparing for the unknown, you know, what we may not have forecasted. Um, frankly, what we can forecast is, is, is the easier part of our respective jobs. So um, I love, you know, Kim, how you kind of frame this as questing for data. Um, really, that's in this world of unknowns where every sense of your well-being, whether it be your health, your job security, your food, um, your ability to go to work, maybe your employer simply could not work. There were so many different unknowns at this time. We found ourselves at this office insatiable for data. We found such comfort in anything that was concrete. So um, while I, I firmly believe that as a, a state, as a city, I believe we've you know, advanced about 10 years in six months. And I mean that from remote work and remote education, which Ohio State had to pivot hard. You all, everyone knew it was forthcoming, but we had to pivot hard. Um, I gave a talk a few weeks ago called Our Foot is on the Accelerator of Change. And I do believe like the, the brick was thrown on the gas pedal of, of a lot of this innovation necessary to allow ourselves to, to pivot and, and do everything remotely. Um, so kind of getting back to that piece of data, we, uh, we tried to uh, open up our arms and obtain any source of data that was gonna be relevant to the city of Columbus. In doing so, we actually had to make a lot of crosswalks happen. A lot of the data that was coming was not at the city of Columbus level. Maybe it was state, maybe it was MSA, maybe it was national. And so we had to make inferences and do kind of some adjustments from employment type to get to the city of Columbus. Why it was so important for us, and we'll, you know, Kim and I will both kind of unpack our respective buckets of revenues later, but we're an income tax driven city where almost 80% of our revenues come from income tax, i.e. people pay income tax where they work. And so it was really important for us to get our arms around employment, employability, and, and how jobs were being affected by COVID. Um, the best outcome of this is that we had already anticipated growing our revenue analytics. We had begun some of that work with actually Professor Hightower and so forth at, at Ohio State. But what really allowed us to, to flourish were these partnerships. The Federal Reserve out of Cleveland, phenomenal. The state has been phenomenal. Um, and, and some private sector, folks like uh, Nationwide's David Burson, he's a chief economist there, they went out of their way to provide us with timely data. So as, as, a, as an elected, I am just so thankful for those partnerships, and they will serve us equally as well in years to come. Okay, good. Thank you. So you, you did mention something I'd like to segue into now, and this will be good background, I think, for our uh, viewers. Um, describe the, the revenue sources for the state and for the city of Columbus. Who pays the bills around here? Uh, Megan, let's start with you. <laughs> well, um, so the city of Columbus is a bit simpler than Kim, so probably good to start over here. So basically at the city of Columbus, we have a handful of types of revenue. But when you have 80% of your, your, uh, your types of revenue in one bucket, the rest are relatively de minimis, but the rest include things like a five percentage from property taxes. We have fines and forfeitures, you know, parking tickets, things like that. Um, we also have some investment earnings. We have a little bit that we get from the state of Ohio through local government fund and, and casino tax revenues. And we have some other really de minimis sources here. But really, when you're talking about our bread and butter, it's our income tax. And Kim for the state of Ohio? Sure. Um, personal income tax and sales taxes are by far our largest sources of, of revenue for the state. So again, that movement of the income tax deadline from April to July was a huge hurdle for us during the final quarter of fiscal year 20. And that was also during a time that April through June timeframe where our sales taxes were so dramatically impacted during those initial months of the pandemic. So um, federal revenue became a key for our ability to close fiscal year 20 
Um, and the largest key there is the federal Medicaid match rate. Um, the federal government um, took several actions early in the pandemic. And one of those actions was to increase the match, the rate um, that the federal government picks up on state Medicaid costs. And that was, um, that enabled us to shift some of uh, uh, 6% of our increasing Medicaid costs to um, federal sources. And that freed some of our state revenues to enable us to balance the budget during that last part of the fiscal year. So while the state and, and um, the state income tax and the state sales tax is such key to our overall revenue perspective, during this period, that federal revenue and that Medicaid match rate became key to our ability to address the fiscal situation directly related to the pandemic. Okay, and to follow up, I'd like to know a little bit more, maybe we can drill down a little more on um, the impact of COVID-19 on state and city resources. What do we think the next budget cycle will look like? We'll start with Megan again. Sure, and I think um, maybe it's important to also acknowledge that the reason why Kim and I have had to make so many quick decisions is because we set, you know, the revenue estimate. We say how much can be spent, and because of the nature of balanced budgets, the expenditure side, whether that be the legislative body, the governor's office proposing budgets, they cannot exceed that. So um, that that has been extremely important for us to try and most realistically forecast so that we maintain structural balance and the way that we, they work. What is so challenging about that is because of these bucket of unknowns, and that's the success of public health efforts, that's the spread of COVID, its duration, it's, you know, it could be very sweeping should there be drastic events that alter uh, revenue collection, but finding that balance by being conservative but realistic um, it's exceedingly challenging. Um, high, high level city of Columbus, we, you know, I, I have did a lot of talks where I compared our immediate economic impact to that of the Nike swoosh. Very, you know, kind of, you know, a very fa famous symbol, immediate drop, of course, gradual reopening as, as two things happened. Businesses were able to reopen as well as businesses were able to pivot. And when I say pivot, I mean, develop technologies that allow them to continue their commerce using e-commerce platforms. I mean, the world of technology, even since 08 and 09, is drastically different. Um, what has changed, though, is that we've really morphed into, uh, it's kind of ubiquitous, a uh, number of folks talking about this, but the letter K. That is the economic model that we're experiencing in Columbus right now. And to just kind of describe that, you know, the letter K, of course, we had an immediate economic fallout as a result of closures. And then we've been able to, you know, we've seen growth upward and we've seen downward decline. The differences there, specifically those who have been able to maintain employment or who have been able to regain meaningful permanent employment are continuing on this kind of upward trend. Conversely, those who have been affected by either long-term job loss or by other factors limiting their employability are showing declining economic statistics. It is definitely more pronounced in certain parts of the country. In the capital city, where we have a variety of, of, of you know, very interesting types of employment, it is really pronounced. Um, so to that, right now, we are seeing uh, a deepening of long-term job loss. I was listening to Bloomberg this morning. Some of the job data this week uh, was very clear about this. Here in the city, while temporary layoffs have slowed every month since April, permanent job losses have increased. That's showing itself in our income tax collections. Um, so, you know, in terms of where we are, you know, right now, um, largely the third quarter, as Professor Landers already pointed out, that was one of, of, I'll say, recovery pace here in Columbus. So July, August, September, we saw a hastening of recovery. Um, but I'm, I'm predicting that to really slow down as we kind of end the 2020 period. Um, as we get out of that recovery pace mindset. In addition, I'm looking at continued levels for most of the early part of 2021. Uh, Kimberly, tell us what's happening at the state. Sure, as I, as I think has been mentioned, um, the 
existing economic models did not really well did not account for what we were seeing here at all there there was not a good model of a um, global pandemic of this size that we could use in our forecasting so it was a lot of up to this point a lot of forecasting on the fly continuously updating our forecasts looking at the revenues as they come in daily weekly monthly and informing how that um, will impact the future right now the state budget it, you know, we're in fiscal year 21 we're um, com we've completed the first quarter of that fiscal year and we're looking ahead towards the next biennial budget so my team works with um, economists we work with the department of taxation to look at what do we expect those revenues to look like and was mentioned um, the Nike swoosh, that long, slow recovery is what we're looking at. But we also know that the um, picture of our economic um, rebound will very much look like the inverse of the curve of the pandemic. And so we're very concerned about the uptick, the you know really kind of dramatic growth of um, COVID cases in these last few weeks. And so again, we're kind of continuously updating our forecasts to account for the data that we're seeing. And um, we know that the course of our recovery will depend on the ability to keep the virus in check. So we're very focused on the health implications and, and the health impacts that then lead to the economic impacts that we know that we'll see going forward. So again, just continuous information, the importance of constantly updated data and communication among all levels of, of government, local, state, federal. I think it's really interesting that that both at the state and city level, you brought up the issue of data and models and communication mm -hmm. as being really, really key to this. And this is an unprecedented event as we keep, keep hearing, but we've also heard about the uh, Great Recession in 2008 and 2009. And we've already heard, uh, I think all three of you have mentioned at least that, that event and some of the contrast with it. So. Let's drill down on that a little more. Um, what did we learn from that recession that's helping us now with this current economic crisis and budget crisis? Uh, Jim. Um, I mean, I, what I'm hearing is I, my, my recollection of the Great Recession um, working for the legislature in Indiana was that we were doing a lot of the same things back then. It was such a heavy hit compared to the recessions we'd been we'd experienced before, for instance, 1991 and then 2001. Um, that you know we were constantly updating things um, in terms of forecasting revenues. It was really from December of 2008 uh, through the budget session over there in Indiana in 2000 in, in the first half of 2009. We were constantly trying to dial in uh, the revenue forecast because the models, first of all, the economic forecasts were way off. Um, and and, and, that, and they, 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 they didn't sort of dial their forecasts in um, the first half of 2009 either. And that affected our revenue modeling because our revenue models uh, were, were based on, uh, were, were driven by these economic factors. Um, statistically, so it made it really hard. And I think what I learned from the Great Recession is, I think in, it's what they're doing right now. Is you have to go beyond those models. You have to start, you know, uh, looking for alternate data sources, um, talking to other economists, talking to people in the business community to try and find out what's really happening uh, right now and where it's going in the future. And you know, it, it, it's been a roller coaster ride since since March, basically economically. And I know that you know uh, there's there's forecasts out there of what's supposed to happen. Uh, I've I've read some of them. I've I've sat through some uh, presentations of forecasts here recently, and I think even more unlike the Great Recession, these are really they're really, what I would say is they're assumption laden. And I think a lot of times economic forecasts that I've, that I've listened to and looked at in the past during recessions, a lot of the assumptions, a lot of the work is trying to 
uh, use the history of the economic factors, GDP, personal income, corporate profits, things of that nature. Um, and you have a pretty significant history, data history that you can look at and try to try to move forward with. Here, when I've looked at forecasts by the Federal Reserve, the Open Market Committee, there's a forecast that's done of GDP by the Atlanta Fed. I've sat through forecast presentations in the last week by uh, IHS Global Insight and Moody's Economy.com. Um, even the, the there's one that's the CBO did in July, which is obviously kind of dated at this point, but all of them have to make assumptions about what I would call sort of medical, social, and political factors that I would hate to have to make assumptions and build a forecast on. Um, they're making assumptions about the second wave. Will a second wave hit? How bad will it be? How severe will it be? They're making assumptions about the degree of social distancing. How, you know, will, will the current degree of social distancing persist and how long? Um, they're making assumptions about when a vaccine will be approved and when it's going to be widely distributed and administered. And then the worst of all is probably they're making assumptions about potential future federal stimulus funding and, and what that might entail. And so you, there's a lot of forecasts out there and they don't look too terrible um, for the third and fourth quarter or for 2021 or 2022. And frankly, the ones I've looked at are looking at unemployment being at a full employment level by 2022 and GDP being at a pre-pandemic level by sort of late 2021, early 2022. But I think those, I think they're really tenuous. I mean, I think, I think state and local officials have to be really careful how much weight they put in those forecasts and how much they drive their, their revenue forecasts on those, because I think right now they're, they're pretty tenuous. Is in, that's my opinion, frankly. Sorry. <laughs> and Megan, what's your opinion? Looking from the, the, the city perspective, um, how, what did you learn from the Great Recession and how much weight are you putting into these forecasts right now? So I'll tag team a little bit of it with Kim, but I'd like to talk more about the story of contrast. I get a lot of questions about how similar or perhaps dissimilar as 20, uh, 20 through 08, 09 in comparison. Um, things that you know are in common, the need for resiliency, communication, and preparation. Um, that's about the only three things that I have in common with the, the Great Recession. Um, in terms of contrast, they're, they're really night and day. The duration between, you know, in Columbus, um, just to kind of set the landscape, we started collecting income tax in 1948. Uh, we we're the second city in the country to do so, actually, after Toledo, Ohio. So since 48, we've only had five negative years of income tax collections, five. Three of those have happened since 2002. So to, to illustrate the importance of, you know, the Great Recession in terms of economic decline, it was because of duration. It was a double dip recession. We ate through our reserves. Local companies used up all of their balance sheets and then some. So the contrasts are really deep when it comes to the footing by which we also entered COVID. It was a period of economic expansion. So when we entered COVID, we had fully funded reserve levels. We had strength in our local economy. Our company's balance sheets around here were doing very well. And largely consumers were doing quite well too. So, um, and that's why I want to tee that up a little bit because something that's quite different is that individuals have more per capita spending ability. We also have more savings ability. In April and in May in Columbus, people saved almost three, uh, a third more than they ever have before. And so again, that's the trajectory of those who are, have, have uh, a gainful employment, permanent employment versus those who do not. But what it's led to is interesting correlations to housing, auto sales, um, sales tax, which I'll, I'll softball lob over to, uh, to Kim. So personal spending is quite different. Duration is quite different. Um, consumer confidence is also quite different as well. Um, but the, the importance of resiliency and, and maintaining those reserves and staying true to your fiscal policies 
that is what helps any any government weather uh, a fiscal storm. Kimberly, what do you think, Kim? Tell us what's happening. What, what's your view from the state? Sure. So as both Jim and Megan have indicated, this uh, economic situation is dramatically different from the Great Recession. Um, the biggest learning from the Great Recession that I think is important that we're keeping in mind at the state level, and I think it's really important for, for all levels of government and um, really everyone, whether you're a private company or, or a household, to keep in mind when you're looking at your budget and the, the current um, situation is paying attention to your reserves, looking at your um, your plan for spending any, any savings, any one-time sources that you may have, and looking at the long-term structural balance of your budget. So we're looking right now at the state level at, you know, what are our one-time sources of revenue? How can that impact this year's budget, next year's budget, and, and even beyond as we, again, deal with that slow recovery of our ongoing revenues? So we don't want to become too dependent with ongoing spending using one-time revenue sources, including reserves. So that I think is a key learning from the Great Recession, the duration, and, and, and as, as we've talked about too today, there really aren't good predictions about the duration. And the duration of the economic situation, again, will depend on the health situation and some of these unknowns, like when will we have a vaccine? When will it be widely available? how will the economy recover after that? And so we have to plan as if this is going to be a, a long-term recovery, as if that you know back end of the Nike swoosh is going to take multiple state fiscal years. And so that's, that's the challenge. That's the challenge, ensuring that your reserves um, last and you're able to balance them with your ongoing priorities. Yeah, certainly we're facing a lot of unknowns right now into the next few years, but let's look out a little bit longer here. Um, someone asked this in the uh, chat, one of the one of the audience members. So we know like things like online shopping and working from home have been growing for years, and now this is accelerating. This may be a longer term trend. What do you think the impacts will be on um, the state budget uh, and state budgets in general? Jim, maybe you could start? From, from, from online? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. Shopping, both. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, I think online shopping, um, especially there, there was, I think it was in 2017, there was a, and this has probably helped budgets, state budgets um, in, in during the summer, to some extent. I mean, there was a, there was a Supreme Court decision in 2017, Wayfair, and it ruled that states had you know, really broad authority to collect or to to require online vendors, online retailers to collect sales tax, um, and they they eliminated a requirement that people had, that businesses had to have a physical presence in a state to collect say to, to be required to collect sales tax. So I think a lot of states, Ohio, one of them, uh, a lot of them in 2019 passed legislation to facilitate this to. So that retailers, online retailers, were collecting state sales tax. So I think that has helped. Um, I know in talking to people in Indiana, they think that it's it has helped uh, sales tax collections during the summer. Uh, those additional collections, as far as telecommuting, I, you know, I think that's more of a to me, it's more of a local impact than a, than a state impact. Um, and I I can. I could talk about that too. Uh, it, I mean, I think the telecommuting issue really, um, you know, that has that the, the, the issue there or the challenge there, or maybe what I'm wondering about is if telecommuting continues in a big way, what impact does that have on in particular sort of downtown commercial districts and vacancy rates for commercial office space? And that's the type of real property that is assessed for property taxes based on what we would call the income approach. It's, it's, it's ba their assessment or assessed value is based on how much income they can generate, the owners can generate from that, that office space 
for instance. So if there's a decline, if there's sort of vacancies as a result of this that, that are more long term, that could, you know, that could show that could result in sort of a decline in assessed values um, and maybe has implications for property taxes. I don't know. Um, that's just my thought on that. Kim, what are your thoughts on that? Just concur with um, what Jim mentioned about online purchases stabilizing our state sales tax over the summer. Uh, that combined with um, pent up demand and federal stimulus really did stabilize the state income tax or state sales tax collections over the summer. So in June, July, and August, our state sales co tax collections actually um, beat estimates, which um, helped stabilize the overall state revenue situation. However, we're starting to see those um, expected long-term slowing effects. Now that the federal stimulus has worn off and um, some of that pinup demand has kind of run its course through the economy in September, we saw our sales tax misestimate along with our, our state income tax as well. So again, we're just continually updating our data, looking at the forecast and being prepared for that um, long-term recovery. Okay, let's 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 bring this on home to us. Those of us who live in Columbus, Ohio, um, Megan, I'd like to talk a bit about the implications for uh, looking forward for Columbus. So, what's going to happen now with um, if the service industries, if tourism, if restaurants, if airlines don't come back at all, or maybe come back slowly? And also, as, as part of that, what do you think is the viability of downtown Columbus rental and housing market looking forward? Uh, do you have good models or predictions or guesses on that? Those are, are those are all great questions. And you know, to take a um, kind of a bird's eye view, if you were to look at the employment composition of the city of Columbus versus the state of Ohio, they're they're quite different. In Columbus, we're really focused in, in some key areas. Actually, they're largely tax exempt. Ohio State, right? So education, healthcare, insurance companies, government, and we have financial services and a growing IT ecosystem. So, you know, those entities, this is the hard part about COVID. Some of those entities, especially in the healthcare space, are not only growing, but they're growing their wages for their employees. So this is um, very important to delineate the the important the number behind unemployment rate and revenues for respective governments, and that's the most challenging aspect of being auditor right now. In Columbus, the individual who has been most affected by COVID has been the black woman. Um, about two in every five black women lost their jobs during COVID. If you look at, in aggregate, the consequence economically of all of that job loss between tourism, restaurants, service industries, direct to consumer, that, that's sizable. Fortunately, a lot of our larger employers, though, have been able to continue working remotely. Um, so I, again, the K is, is definitely showing itself more in Columbus than it was a couple of months ago. To your questions about downtown and you know predictions, um, as some of you know, uh, Hugh Dorian, who is my predecessor, taught at the Glen College for, I think, 27 years. Um, he was here in City Hall for over 50, uh, 52 years. One of the things that he loved was history, and he was a history hoarder. So in this office, we have the journals from 1918 from the Spanish flu, and it's great. I, I've read them on the weekends um, back in March and April. That's actually really more than 08 and 09. Those have been probably more useful to understand consumer sentiment and employee sentiment and just comfort. It's, that's been really interesting to me. So the quantitative piece is more kind of cut and dry, but the qualitative has been fascinating. So initially, you know, we saw some concern about being in downtown with, you know, density and so forth. I'm not seeing that right now. And, you know, you look at housing, yes, a lot of folks are shifting to the suburbs, but that's because single family home sales are up in a very large way. People are looking to have this opportunity of entering into mortgages because rates are so low right now. 
and they're looking at, you know, taking this uh, advantage right now to kind of, uh, you know, set their own destiny uh, of where they want their families to be. So housing values, um, apartments downtown, very stable. I'm very pleased with that. Um, office space, it's about rebirth right now. And so I, I really do believe this is where I might get, um, I'm very bullish on Columbus. I'm also a pretty optimistic person. Um, but if you think about why am I bullish on Columbus, our affordability and our talent, Ohio State, Columbus State, our other colleges and universities in our region, they're cranking out talent each and every single day. And so a lot of these companies that are on the coast in more dense areas are saying, wow, we can do a lot more in Columbus and in central Ohio. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and I'll tell you someone who's really inspired my my perception of the ability to reshape and innovate is Johanna Burton, their CEO of the Webster Center for the Arts. There is no more resilient a person than an artist, right? So I've been inspired by her vision for our downtown space, um, which is uh, which is pretty exciting. So I'm bullish on Columbus. I'm actually, if you look at population growth post uh, Spanish flu, Paris, London, New York all grew in size. Um, I'm anticipating the same thing for Columbus. So it's our job for government, though, to meet those citizens where they are, the demographics they're bringing in, their education levels, et cetera, and do better to alter our service levels to meet their needs. I'm glad to hear that optimistic view. Um, I, I, I share your, your, um, your optimism about Columbus. Uh, I think we'll turn it over to some audience questions now. Uh, Katie Phillips, please. Yeah, we have some really great questions and quite a few related to debt. Um, so I'm going to try to combine these the best I can. Are you anticipating any type of debt crisis, either publicly held or privately held? And what are the potential consequences of this for the state and the city of Columbus? Who wants to start? You mean to start, Harvey, and I'm not picking the chair. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so in the city of Columbus, you know, our debt portfolio, AAA rated, uh, which is about the, is the highest credit rating you can have, um, our debt, our, our capital plan will remain the same. Um, unlike some of our cities across the nation that have had to look at restructuring debt, um, to pushing its principal out to allow for more um, financial freedom up front, we're not having to do that. That's again, the nature of duration and how we have not been as effective in comparison to some other cities across the nation. Uh, in terms of local, um, seeing some you know, per capita changes, housing, mortgages, things like that. Um, but because of the duration, this recovery in my mind here locally has been the fastest one, um, fastest recession we've had in and, in and out. So I'll kick it over to Kim for state thoughts. Sure, from a state perspective, we were restricted from is issuing debt for any ongoing operational kinds of costs. So we, um, we have a debt portfolio that is focused on capital projects. We're continuing those projects, um, but you know, we're, it, it, as far as our communications with credit rating agencies, they're really looking at the structural balance of our budget. I mentioned that earlier, ensuring that um, governments are not becoming too reliant on one-time revenue and then putting themselves in positions of you know, not being able to meet all of their needs going forward and, and the ability to continue to make all of your debt service payments is always, always key. I don't see a crisis like that affecting the state of Ohio because we really are restricted in how we issue debt and for what purposes, and we manage that very conservatively. Jim, do you want to jump in on that as well? Uh, no, not really. I think they covered it. Yeah. Okay, good. Katie, next question. Is the revenue impact similar for enterprise funds, and what is the lag in recovery for those revenues in comparison to general funds or income tax? Somebody's a fiscal geek out there. <laughs> I feel like someone in my office, someone in my office <laughs> is asking this question right now. This is not a, uh, a softball love. Um, you know, here at the city, it's easy because we're, uh, our enterprises, uh, our water, sanitary sewer system, our electricity system, 
and our storm sewer system. We also have some couple parking garages downtown. Our enterprises, unlike income tax, have not been as affected. However, we, you know, we do have some delinquencies, some increase in, in folks being unable to pay. Um, that's very uh, anticipated. But on the whole, you know, I'm really for infrastructure right now. Infrastructure is a great multiplier, meaning that if we invest in roads, we're bringing in asphalt. A local firm is going to be actually pouring the asphalt. Someone else is going to be paving it. You know, that is a multiplier effect to keep revenues in our own uh, geographical space. So I'm really positive on infrastructure, uh, but that's a really good question. Anyone else want to jump in? That was very Megan specific, I suppose. <laughs> Katie, another question? Um, so with this present crisis, what does the state say about having a much larger rainy day fund for the future? I, I can start on that. I think that that, that was an, a learning of the last recession, the need to ensure that you have adequate reserves and building, rebuilding the state's rainy day fund was absolutely a focus of the last decade, right? So we are in a solid position with a strong um, balance in our rainy day fund. Currently we have almost $2.7 billion and um, that equates to about 11% of our annual tax revenues. So, so again, we're in, a, we're in a really solid position there. But when you spend those one-time resources, you have to look towards how you're affecting that structural balance of your budget again. I feel like I'm a broken record on, that, on this topic, but it is just so important that you, um, you know, don't spend all of your reserves up front to meet the most immediate crisis related needs and that you balance that with your long-term needs to help citizens with, um, the economic fallout that will continue to impact folks for multiple years. So social service needs we know will be greater as we move through recovery. And so we have to make sure that we are maintaining the ability to provide those services and to um, help our local partners provide those services. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that, that, um, that was one thing that was learned from the Great Recession was that most states went into the Great Recession with insufficient reserves. Um, I think the, the thing I read a long time ago was that that I think that, that the revenue shortfalls during the revenue during the Great Recession were like twice what the reserves were uh, when the recession started. And I know from my experience and then just talking to legislative fiscal leaders in the states. They have been hell bent in most states since the Great Recession to rebuild reserves and actually build them even bigger than they 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 had before the the Great Recession. And they did. I mean, at, at the end of fiscal 19, states had really historic levels of reserves. And I look at them in terms of the percentage of spend for the next fiscal year. Um, and the average for states at the end of fiscal 19 was about 13.5%. Uh, reserves, and there were only about, I think, 12 or 13 that had a reserve less than 10%, which is sort of an old kind of uh, rule of thumb or benchmark. So I, I think what goes along with that is elected leaders have to convince the public, the voters, that this is a good thing. And they have to, they have to convince other elected officials at times that it's not a good thing to spend reserves. And it's not always a great thing to refund them to taxpayers that you have reserves so that when you hit a recession like this or like the great recession, you can fund programs that you would otherwise have to cut. Um, and, and I would agree with Kim, I think you have to hold the reserves. You make cuts and you keep the reserves because you don't know how long this is gonna last or what's gonna happen. And as I said earlier, revenues lag the economy. So um, you have to be careful of that. Megan, any thoughts on this? It's easier to look back at 02 through about 09 for us because that's a full life cycle. But you know, we had 
such revenue loss across the board from the longevity of the, of, uh, of the Great Recession that it began with the cuts on the expenditure side, eliminating uh, in non-essential things, you know, et cetera. As duration continued, it, we then had to, when tax revenues, like even, even if we have a low but positive year in income tax, when you have population growth and your taxes are only growing like this, there's still a delta that continues to grow. And that gap, you know, the better way to put it is we have more people who need more services, but you're getting less revenues per capita. So you can't maintain, you still have to find ways to, to cut. So over a period of multiple years, we went through all of the one times, we started eating into our reserves, and we found ourselves with a reduction in our essential city services. Um, we had to eliminate um, a lot of programs. We had to cut rec centers. We had to cut um, services that I think are, were, were quite important to the overall well-being of an individual citizen. That led to a tax increase in 2009. That was approved by our voters. But in doing so, we pledged to them, we will rebuild the rainy day fund. And we have, and that's where it stands today. It's a little bit shy of that 10% benchmark that, uh, of, of total annual expenditures that we, we strive for. However, you know, part of what I think is important to, for viewers to, to think about, um, and this will be changing in even the time Kim and I have been and, and Jim in, in the work and the career, the, the importance of management. That is now quantified by the rating agencies, by the overseers. They're looking to make sure that in the times of fiscal distress, that governments are going to have the willpower and the ability to come together to make very tough decisions. And so whether that be cutting, whether that be in employing the rainy day fund, it takes in a lot more support and approval than just Kim and myself now. Um, we require a lot of different parties to come together. So that's what the agencies look for. Do, do the governments have the man, do, do the governmental management you know, bodies have the ability to make very tough decisions and perhaps do they have a history of it? So um, I hope not to dip into the rainy day fund, but all of that is subject to duration. Katie, do we have time for one last question in the last three minutes? Um, this one is for Jim specifically, and it's how is Ohio comparing to other states? Uh, you know, I mean, I think I think Ohio is, uh, you know, Ohio is sort of uh, like a lot of states. They depend on the state depends on income and sales tax for most of its general revenues, um, and that's like most states. I think. When I've talked to people in a couple other states that I talked to, one is which is Indiana, I, I think things are sort of the same. I mean, when I've heard what I've heard Kim talk about in terms of revenues and how they've been behaving since April, and in particular during the summer, it's the same thing I'm hearing from Indiana, which is a lot like Ohio in terms of its revenue setup. It's it's primarily it's split. It's a mix of income and sales tax. Like Ohio, it's a much more sales tax heavy state than the average state. Um, but they're seeing, you know, what, what they're seeing is sort of similar. I would guess that what Ohio is seeing is, you know, uh, they, had, they, had, they had pretty good wage withholdings during the summer. Um, they had the sales tax that, that was coming in fairly well. I would see now they're probably wage withholdings are, are falling off. And the quarterly estimated payments that taxpayers make, which are primarily sole businesses and investments, um, those are probably those are probably problematic right now. That's that's what I'm hearing from Indiana. I don't know. Am I right, Kim? I, I think so. Generally, um, we we've been following. Um, there's an index that Moody's and um, CNN put out called the. Um, back to normal index. And so we've been following that and Ohio has been, um, they, they update it weekly. We've been in the like 9, 10, 11 rankings um, compared to all 50 states. So I would say we're, we're so far weathering it um, comparatively better than a lot of places. And I think that kind of our quick decision-making on, on all accounts helped us do, you know, be where we are today, and, but we need to maintain that. 
Megan, any last comments before we wrap up? I think that we have great leadership right now in making these tough decisions. And I do believe that governments across the country, that's going to separate great governments from good governments and from governments that have not been able to respond. So unlike um, maybe prior economic events, this one in particular, the will to, to put public health first and the will to say forcibly you have to close down business for the betterment of public health, um, that's tangible. And so I think uh, uh, I agree with you in terms of general economics, but I think our, our people make us uh, a slightly uh, more positive state. Okay, great. That's, that's a great ending note. So um, thank you very much, Megan Kilgore from the city of Columbus, Kimberly Murnix from the state of Ohio, and Jim Landers from OSU. Um, Really great discussion. Glad to see that our fiscal uh, boat is uh, being run by really capable people. And Jim, for your uh, research and teaching and shaping of uh, Megan's career, apparently. So <laughs> I don't know. It's been... I didn't do a very good job of teaching her about recession, though. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to do something about that. Just pandemics, Jim. Just pandemics. Okay. All right. I think, I think, I think, I think she's learning now. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. Join us again on November 6th for our impact of COVID on K through 12 education and also November 30th for our economic impacts panel part two. Uh, take care everyone, stay well, right. stay healthy and um, enjoy Bye -bye. your weekend. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.